Well, welcome to uh, our panel on uh, rewiring the infrastructure. And uh, we're going to do three 10-minute uh, interviews and then all come back together for a wider conversation. So, um, uh, Jose, I've, I've been here now exactly uh, six hours. And um, it usually takes me eight hours to write a column, but six hours is good. And um, uh, I already got the column because I heard a phrase in the last six hours multiple times um, that I have not heard before at a COP um, or an energy conference, and that is stranded assets. Stranded assets, that is the word of the day. And one of the reasons uh, assets seem to be stranded is because innovative companies like your own are uh, able to create uh, clean power systems now and infrastructure at prices that aren't just competitive with coal, but knock coal out of the box. Bring me up to date. How did you strand all those assets? <laughs> well, I tell you, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole new situation to me, too. I mean, it's, uh, uh, to put it pretty graphically, I used to be, for the past 20 years, pushing the, the establishment, the energy establishment, trying to get these this whole change in paradigm uh, to happen. And uh, suddenly from one day, day to the other, I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's, what That's what happened. That's what happened, it broke. No, can it, is it on? Uh, is it on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on, yeah. So I Speak a little suddenly louder. didn't have to push anymore. There's no one to push there. And so I see all these old uh, friends who've been sort of under my uh, in front of me, now I see them running next to me. And so I say, hey guys, you're not supposed to be there. <laughs> uh, what, what are you doing here? Well, so they're running fast, and they're running faster than me. Really? I mean, they're running as fast. But these guys... It's mine. That was mine, that was mine. Um, these guys, this okay. whole, this whole um, energy... Mm -hmm. Thank you. This whole, the conventional energy system has uh, changed, um, has changed pace in very little, very short time. And in my view, what's happening is that um, many big companies in the conventional energy sector have realized that they need to put themselves up to date and they need to make a huge effort. Together with one single very simple factor is they do n these assets don't have much time left. They so what are they trying to do? They're basically so they're it's trying a, it's to a fire, sa fire sale of their assets well, to, they're, they're to get into your business. They know they they know they're going to have to uh, drop them, strand them uh, sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later. Particularly, we do reach agreements um, in COP21. So they, in order to maintain a the essence of being a company, they need to invest um, at any cost, almost at any cost, mm. in uh, in renewable energy assets. So suddenly we find uh, examples like, uh, for example, um, Morocco opening yesterday at uh, 2.8 cents a kilowatt hour. For wind? For wind. You lie. Yeah, 2.8 cents. 2.8 cents. Yeah, that's the equivalent price uh, on, the, on the bid. That's the average price. Uh, and that's, that's on, a, on, a, on a bid that's a ramp up from uh, uh, growing prices. So it starts at two. Wow. It ends up at two average on the life of the assets, 2.8. So, and that's not only, I mean, this is, the, this is the, uh, the, the last and most aggressive example that I've seen, but I've seen a number of others which are always surprising, i.e. South Africa, uh, we've seen changes there. We've seen Chile, 75 percent reduce the reduction in prices wow. from the first auctions to now to the most recent. So, well, solar would be in what range? In South Africa, the last auction I think it was something like 40, 42 euros, 42 so dollars a megawatt hour, so 4.2 so cents four kilowatt hour. So, <coughs> the tendency is now uh, in Chile, for example, there was an auction which was uh, technology agnostic. So the, the government was, uh, was uh, offering uh, 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 big bunches of energy to be supplied over the next 10 years, 20 years. And um, the, all, the, all the energy awarded was renewable. Not one single megawatt of, um, megawatt hour of uh, conventional energy was supplied. 
was well, one. What's the biggest thing so that could come out of this cup that would propel your business right now forward even more at this critical moment? What kind of government policies? Undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly uh, carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is the horizontal, if I may say, it's a holy grail. It's what, um, it's what changes uh, the, whole, the whole model. We, talk, we often talk about five, um, 500 billion subsidies. But the truth is that subsidies, those are, those are direct subsidies, but we have, I'm not sure what the number is. In fact, they talk about five trillion annual subsidies related to the indirect uh, effects of, uh, of emissions. So carbon pricing, taking off a portion of that would be, I think, the horizontal effect. It would drive mm. technology, it would drive R&D, it would drive investment, it would drive, it would drive uh, cons consumer habits, because products which, ha which have a higher carbon incorporation would be more expensive. It would be the most simple way, uh, the simplest and the most effective way of, uh, of um, changing the... What's the biggest thing, is it bringing about this, um, uh, this real uh, collapse in prices, what's the biggest technological innovation going on out there? Is it the use of big data? Is it um, uh, better GPS? Is it just moving down the cost volume learning curve? What's getting us there? I think scale. Mm -hmm. I think scale. I think scale. Um, particularly in PV. In mm. PV scale. Um, in wind, there are a number of technologies that have been very effective. Um, for example, uh, concrete towers. Uh, mm -hmm. Concrete towers. Concrete towers is a great is a great element of competitiveness in this industry because traditionally, uh, where if you start working in the if you start working in the uh, less developed countries in the developing economies where there aren't uh, very good transport infrastructures, if you think uh, the, co the, the 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 difficulty of transporting a hundred meter. Uh, pieces uh, of 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 steel which have to be manufactured in very in, in very far away so concrete uh, is a very uh, sort of well distributed type of uh, of um, um, uh, technology in terms of foundations and and towers that would be a factor <coughs> also new technologies in terms of uh, materials for blades mm. it's uh, also affecting but i think scale is the main thing at this stage um, when you, you know, think of where, th I mean, when I think of where things, what you're saying now, where will things be in five years, do you think, if we stay on this trajectory? Well, I, I've, I've given a lot of thought to where we will be in terms of how we're going to, th there's a big debate now on, on whether we're going to go more for utility scale generation or for distributed generation, and I think we probably will end up in the middle of the way situation. For example, there was a, I was um, seeing a practical uh, case in Mexico City a couple of weeks ago where the nature of the new um, urban areas in Mexico City, w w which you all know they're a bit, bit of a mess. I mean, this, they're not, there's, there's no um, organized urbanization. Mm -hmm. Um, so deploying utility scale electricity is very difficult, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So there, probably it's um, most efficient for distributed energy. While in other cities, such as more developed cities, probably utility scale, so long as the space, is more cost effective. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see that the, the, the developing, in the developing uh, economies and the huge urban um, growth are going to see a lot of distributed. Um, but I think we will be seeing uh, an immense grow in our industry, an immense grow it, in our it, industry. It, it does sound like that, you know, energy has always been a scale business, uh, if you want to make a dent. Um, if you don't have scale, you're, you really have a hobby. And uh, you wouldn't try to change the climate as a hobby. But it does feel like we're now starting to get that scale, that, that kind of systemic scale. Indeed, indeed, that's uh, what we're seeing, and as I say, the biggest, uh, I was saying at the beginning, the clearest sign is that uh, 
we no longer have to push, we now have to run. So we have uh -huh. to, to develop a new set of muscles for this one. <laughs> Fantastic, that's actually the best news I've got today. I would say thank you very much. I'm doing speed dating here, so I'm gonna invite um, uh, Hans Vestberg up and uh, to continue from Ericsson. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hans, thank you very much. So what's a nice telephone guy like you doing in a place like this? Good um, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I can really you know, start with you with the, um, uh, uh, where we left off, because it, it feels to me that the whole um, digitization revolution yeah. uh, and big data is now being applied to energy and managing management. Absolutely. No, I think that... Uh, I am definitely here, and both, of course, as representing Ericsson, but I'm also a board member of the UN Foundation. Mm -hmm. Worked a long time with the advocacy around ICT as a main driver for the sustainable development goals, and clearly for the carbon fit footprint as well. And, and what we don't realize is that we have an exponential technology development in the next five years. I mean, we think that everybody has internet and has gone very, f very fast where we are, but to be honest, the next five years, it's is an exponential growth of how many people on this earth that will have 3G and 4G, how, ma how much sort of coverage we will have. So you can say that 90% uh, of the earth population will have either 3G or 4G, 2020, uh, mobile coverage, all people on Earth except 300 million. So why is this important? It's important because suddenly this becomes a transformative enabler. Mm. And infrastructure... That scale becomes... That scale. And compared to other industries, we actually use the same R&D. Think about that. Mm. You bring your phone from wherever you come to Paris and it works. Because of a simple reason, we have joint R&D, yeah. joint patterns when we do 2G, 3G, 4G, and it will come on 5G as well. So, and now we see that enabler, of course, starting the entire people, we can do whatever we want to do. Now it's industries, internet of things, smart cities, etc., and ultimately society, digital education, digital healthcare. All this is, of course, enormously important if we want a sustainable growth. Getting countries to have economical growth decoupled from sort of using CO2 emission in order to get there. And we see that in countries which starting from another level, they haven't the all infrastructure from the beginning, digital healthcare, mobile payment, okay. things like that just immediately start to happen. And that's why the IC ICT industry, mobility, broadband and cloud right. is so important for this conversation. I'm actually working on a new book now that's related to that. Yeah, you always do a book. It, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the world is fast. Yeah. And, um, but one thing, in fact, I, I, uh, I, uh, I, never, I never use the word cloud. No, why not? Because it sounds so fluffy. Yeah, it, it, is, sounds, it, it is fluffy. It's it up sounds there. so soft, so benign. It sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. <laughs> I've looked at clouds from. This ain't no cloud. This is a supernova. Absolutely. This is the explosion of a star. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it is pulsating more yeah. and more energy all the time. It ain't just one explosion. And I see it happening in the digital world. But I'm fascinated how you see that looping back into the energy space, I would Absolutely. assume both in the efficiency realm yeah. and in the uh, generation realm. Absolutely, in both, because first of all, you, you see clearly uh, many majors, uh, mayors and, and the governors starting to say, oh, my city is going to have smart grids. Mm. Uh, and we are all super excited for connected cars and all of that, and we should yes, be. Sir. But to be honest, when it really makes things happening is when you connect the cars and you can do traffic management, mm -hmm. and that's a cloud-based or a right. supernova, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. then you can reduce your CO2 emission and our uh, forecast that we have right now if we use ICT right we can reduce the carbon footprint with 15% 2030 that's the current carbon footprint of US and Europe together if we use Just ICT. bringing that intelligence absolutely to the yes and using the technology mm -hmm. uh, as an enabler for also CO2 emission uh, which I think is just inevitable and we have to do it along with renewable energies what, uh, I'm going to ask, want to ask everybody this question because I think it's so vital. You know, what can come out of this COP and, and what sort of government policies can really be an enabler of this transformation? I think that I've been working in the Broadband Commission, which is a, a UN or organization, and we have seen a tremendous grow, uh, growth there. We had 30 countries in the world that had a broadband uh, plan. Now we have 
140 countries. That's the first step. The second step is that any country in the world would have an inter-ministerial ICT strategy because that means they're going to use ICT across education, healthcare, smart cities and all of that. Uh, I think that's very important for enabling my sort of industry. And secondly, I think ICT competence in governments will be important. Mm -hmm. I think industries, they will do it. You're listening to the energy companies here, you had ABB and all the companies up earlier. All of them are using mobility broadband and the supernova cloud mm -hmm. in order to be efficient. So that will happen. It's more about society using it and governments actually using this technology. Don't use supernova till my book comes out. <laughs> um, uh, I have a new um, word. Uh, what? Um, <laughs> uh, what does it mean, though, for a developing country? Can they really benefit from this, or is this really going to still be out of reach for them? No, I think that it's even more important for the developer because they will start with this infra infrastructure from the beginning. I mean, I mean, look at Africa. We will go from 70 million mobile broadband subscriptions right now to 700 million 2020. That's how wow. many mobile broadband subscriptions, how many will be enabled to get mm. the information as anyone in the world. So, of course, it's even more relevant uh, to use this infrastructure to actually transform, you do a sustainable growth, bringing up more middle class, and uh, see that everybody has the equal chance on this earth. And I think that their ICT has a great role to play, but then governments also need to use it. It's not only for YouTube and, and cool things, it's actually also being an enabler for a much better life on this earth. And one of the you know, um, great things about um, uh, all these technologies is how quickly they, they can scale. What, what, of all the things bubbling to the surface now, what excites you the most that you see? <laughs> you got such a perch. Wow. We are in 180 countries. Um, we're working every day in different yeah. places, so it's a lot of things. One thing that really excites me is 5G. Uh, because 2G, 3G and 4G is done only for consumers. Mm -hmm. Better throughput and better speeds. That was the only thing we did. 5G is now designed for the industrial internet, meaning we're going to recognize if it's a heart monitor, mm -hmm. we're going to recognize if it's a sensor outside the power grid, if it's an autonomous car, and we can give them different characteristics from the network. That will be enormously transformative when 5G comes. We still can do a lot with 4G and the mobility and the broadband and all of that, but definitely it excites me when I'm sitting down with different industries from all around the world discussing how they can be more efficient. Let's say dematerializing a product to a service using uh, the 5G. And that's what we're talking about, sustainability. That's how we can get much less so with CO2 emission in the world. You know, one of the things that I think people uh, in OPEC um, underappreciated when they decided to lower the price last year in order to knock out North Dakota, basically, um, <laughs> uh, is the, spe the speed of technological change. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, and the other, it, I don't think they saw this, it's that um, Google is an energy company today. They bought Nest. Yeah. Apple is an energy company yeah. today. They have um, a home energy management yeah. system on the Apple iPhone yeah. 6. I watched my daughter sit in Colorado and turn down her air conditioning in Washington mm. on her iPhone. And it sounds like Ericsson is an energy company too. And you know, my grandma had a saying, Grandma Friedman, and she said, never compete against Google, Apple, and Ericsson at the same time. <laughs> She was a wife. Th that's, that's a what, tagline of that's today. What, that's what Grandma Friedman says, yeah. and that's what OPEC is doing yeah. now. And Grandma Friedman is absolutely right. Yeah, I exactly. mean, all that enablement that the Google and the Facebooks and the, mm. and the Apple is doing is based on that we have this infrastructure that is contiguous. And to be honest, it's private money. Operators have built networks all around the world, and they will continue. That is a fantastic yeah. enabler. And just look at the innovation on people. And they're going to do innovation on energy savings, for sure. If it's Apple and Google will do it, it's going to be so many more see the potential, using efficiencies, seeing that you turn on the, and off the light, knowing when it's the time to use the best uh, it electricity. Yeah. And all of that will happen. Are your biggest customers today, Hans, are they countries or are they cities? <laughs> uh, still, it's the operators, but the usage is, of course, cities, mm -hmm. because the majority of all, think about that, the data traffic will basically grow some 10 times from now to 2020, mm -hmm. but uh, how much uh, energy we more we're going to use is, is very, very little. Yes. So we're going to produce so much more data, yeah. but with the same CO2 emission. Yes. And think about the efficiency on that. And wow. that's happening in urbanization because there's so much data traffic in cities today. 
Terrific. This is enormously exciting. I'm <laughs> going to do my next speed date, but you're coming back, okay? <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank I really you. appreciate Thank it. You. Well, well, well. Um, God, where, 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 uh, where do I start? I mean, it's, um, uh, well, let's start in the home. Um, you know, what, what do you think, uh, in what way um, are you guys enabling the clean home, the carbon-free home? How close are we to it? I, I think we're getting really close. You know, depending on which, which places you look at, you can get to 80, 90 percent of your energies or, or clean energy. Um, to, to have a 100% clean energy, I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon, mm -hmm. but we can eventually get there, but um, getting to a point where you're at uh, 80 or 90, uh, it's, it's definitely achievable. And in fact, we're doing it today. How do you do it? Um, so it does it have to, but let me ask you, because I'm, I'm in the market, so, but does it have to be a new house, or can I do it with my existing house? Yeah, so, so the in the U.S., the primary source of rooftop solar that yeah. has, has scaled is th the concept is uh, you go to the house, you install the solar system um, for free, you pay for the equipment, the company pays for the equipment, pays for the installation, insurance, the maintenance, everything. It's a no-brainer for me. No-brainer. The homeowner then just pays for the electricity, and you pay less for the electricity than you do from the utility. Give me some numbers. So California, um, cost of energy, the average rate is around 20, 23 cents a kilowatt hour. They would go uh, to Solar City, of course, and, um, <laughs> uh, and they would pay 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Wow. So, so, so a fairly so big de delta. Yeah. Um, now California does have high energy rates, but yeah. normally the, uh, the delta, in, in we, we service in 19 states, we try and design the pricing to show customers a 15 to 20 percent savings of their electricity rates. And it's all based on rooftop solar. So it's all rooftop. Um, our, our business focuses on residential rooftop and, and commercial. We actually do utility scale too, but that's our primary focus. So do you need do you, do you need police protection from utilities? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it how, how how are the utilities you know handling this? Um, because they don't strike me as the most forward-leaning people in the world. Yeah, th so they, they, um, they're not liking it. Um, the, their whole position is, oh, there's this massive cost shift that's occurring, you know, the rich are going solar and the, and the poor have to pay for that. I mean, you are like Uber to the taxi business, you are Solar City to the utility business. Th th yeah. Sure, exactly, and now the fundamental issue to the utility is nothing at all to do with a, a cost shift. There is no cost shift. Any study done shows there's actually a cost benefit um, the issue is competition, mm. enabling competition. Mm -hmm. so, so if you've been in an industry for the last, you know, depending on what utility you're looking at, 50 to 100 years, you've never had competition. T to me, the hmm. number one cause of innovation is competition. Interesting. Like, like, without competition, the phones that we have would, would, would like make a call, but they would suck. Yeah. Um, with, with competition, it allows all the innovation that has occurred. So that is opening up Pandora's box. If, if you allow the platform to open, the grid platform to open, allow competition to, to come up with the solutions, I don't really know what they will create, but be very innovative solutions to the problem. It will end up driving down the cost, yeah. uh, the consumer will be benefit, and electricity rates will start stabilizing. It makes no sense that uh, when you've hit mass scale, that rates continue to go up. The only reason why they go up is if you look at the business model, the business model is designed to get a, a guaranteed return on your cost. So your motivation is yeah. to have more cost. Yeah. And so this is actually something I think is, is going to change. Uh, New York's leading this right now, um, creating a different revenue model so that the utilities will be less resistant to, to this transformation. And create a revenue model where the utility is indifferent whether they deploy the infrastructure mm. or somebody else deploys the infrastructure. Open it up, allow competition to come up with a solution. The utility subscribes to that, makes a profit off it, right. and then uh, gives it to the uh, consumer. Today, most utilities in- And they, they, they kind of make a system out of it. That's right, basically. Uh, so yeah. the grid's still yeah. needed. Right. Like, like the, the, still the, the, the grid still provides right. a- A, a base load sort of system. A, yeah. it load balances everything. Right, yeah. So, so that, that is important. Um, but today, the utility, if they use somebody else's service or somebody else's infrastructure, it has to be a pass-through cost. 
So if it costs them $100, they can only charge $100. They can't charge $110. Right. If you change the policy that they can charge $110, then you know, they would have made $10 anyway if they reported themselves. Give them their $10. It's interesting that you say it because it's, um, I, I remember in researching the a book I wrote on energy that uh, I believe it was the utility industry or maybe it was the energy industry in, in as a whole, but it was a $1 trillion business. And they spent less on research than the American dog food industry, you know, um, <laughs> uh, because they were not in, there was no competition. They, didn't, they really had no reason to. It was all passed through. Um, so the idea that you would be bringing that scale of disruption and innovation to that industry, because um, it's a pretty big industry, the utility business. That would, that, that's, that's truly differentiating. Yeah, I mean, like, th th one of the biggest innovations is someone not going to your house to read a meter. Yeah. Like, th that, we can do a lot more than that. That's right. <laughs> I think we've been doing that, like, since 1890. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? We could probably get beyond that, you yeah. know? I mean, that's buggy whip uh, Actually, stuff. a lot of people yeah. still have to go to your house and read the meters. Yeah. So that's not even all the yeah. utilities haven't even deployed smart meters yet. It's a, um, W again, the question we, we've been asking everybody, uh, which is, um, what can government do to enable and enhance this, n enable it to scale? So, so government plays a really, really imp uh, important role. Um, y you have, uh, you know, federal or worldwide government. Um, but yes, you have local government. Um, uh, worldwide, uh, as mentioned earlier, I, I think th the best outcome would be to to price in the externalities, uh, right. a, a, a tax on on carbon. An, an example I like to give is, let's say there was an amazing innovation, okay, and call it um, uh, Dirty Energy Plus. This innovation costs half of coal. I'm just brainstorming here. Half of coal, but it's 10 times worse in terms of CO2 emission. Hmm. You'd get the coal industry to say, hey, we should do a carbon tax, because it would disrupt the coal industry. It's right. 10 times worse. But if it were to be deployed, the reason why it's ten t uh, half the price is because the, uh, it gets to pollute for free. So that external cost right. is not built into it. Now that's just a hypothetical example, but that's exactly what's happening right now with, um, with coal and, and natural gas. Natural gas less so, but, but coal specifically. They are getting to a massive subsidy to pollute for free, which then brings down their cost of energy. Um, so, so, so a tax on, on carbon. Locally, create policy that gives consumers choice. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of consumers feel handicapped. When, I, when, I, uh, uh, when, when they hear about the problem, um, they want to make a change, um, uh, they really want to do the right thing, how do they do the right thing? Often there's restrictions for them to even adopt clean energy. So their first instinct is probably to call the utility, and the utility says wrong number, basically. It's yeah. just like, oh, yeah, we, we have a clean energy program. And a lot of utilities yeah. do it and pay uh, more for clean energy. Right. So, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> so, so that's, yeah. um, if there's an incentive to do something, uh, humans will tend to do it. The incentive is to pollute, so right. we're going to continue to right. pollute. Yeah. Um, so uh, let, let's stop that incentive. But the, uh, if you allow uh, consumers choice, they will, most people want to use clean energy. If you're given the choice of using clean energy for less than dirty energy, well, then the incentive is in the right place. Uh, most people would choose clean energy for, for less. Um, but allow that competition to occur, allow that choice to occur. And that, that requires state or local um, policy Very change. Interesting, yeah. um, uh, and, and of course, the incumbents will. These are all PUCs. These are all public utility. Uh, PUCs yeah, or yeah. ACCs, yeah. Yes. Um, do you, do you see, are there, and I, I know there are, far-sighted PUCs who see this coming and say, I want to buy Solar City. I mean, if I were a far-sighted PUC, I'd say, you know, you are Uber and I want to own you. I, I'd, I'd think that would be, a r in fact, I highly encourage, whether it's PUC or utilities, yeah. get into the space. Yeah. Um, now, what's really key is for all utilities who ever want to consider this, or, or, or PUCs enabling the utilities to do this, is that it's not under the regulated division. Remember, if a if somebody if a utility makes a bad decision, the ratepayer pays for it right. for the most part. Right. Allow allow the utilities to participate, but to compete in the normal markets like everybody mm. else, and don't right. use the uh, rate base to protect right. it. So go ahead and make those investments. In fact. Um, uh, PG&E, uh, uh, one of the largest utilities in, in, in the U.S., um, got into the space and actually has done hundreds of millions of dollars 
into uh, distributed rooftop solar. Interesting. Um, the, the, the previous CEO came from uh, the phone industry and saw what happened uh, to landline and, and cell phones and thought, okay, we, you've got to look into this. Um, they were going to go really large, um, uh, but unfortunately, there was the San Bruno uh, explosion and uh, everything just got focused back to the, the core business, which is important to make sure the core business operates really well. But my hope was that that would be a, a domino effect for other utilities to, to start getting into the space. We've we, we got a massive problem ahead of us. This yeah. is 80 years of infrastructure, 100 years of infrastructure. We've got to change it out in 20. So we've got to, got to get everybody on board. We began with stranded assets. We end with stranded assets. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring everybody back and we'll continue the conversation. You know, the thing that occurs to me, having now listened to all three of you, and this is enormously exciting, is um, you guys would make a hell of a company together. <laughs> Ericsson, Asia, Solar City. You, you, you would be one giant <laughs> um, uh, uh, company. Uh, but I in all seriousness, and anybody pick up on this to start with, um, uh, there's going to have to be a lot of region, because this is a scale business. Uh, it takes a lot of capital, um, and it takes a lot of scale. Um, how is the whole energy industry going to change as a result of this? Anybody want to start in? The nice thing about it is, especially when it comes to distributed uh, 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 energy, um, uh, or even, even centralized, you're, it's not at the same scale as, as a big um, power plant. So you, you can do it in really small steps. Right. So whether it's a 10 megawatt solar farm or 100 megawatt solar farm versus a five kilowatt home, you can just do that a you know, hundred of those a day or a thousand of those a day. Um, and uh, uh, then that allows you to you know, just do incremental steps at a time. It starts getting bigger and bigger. Uh, our company has been doubling for the last uh, nine years every year. Wow. So when, when, you, when, you, when you double small numbers, they, yes. they start becoming big numbers. Big numbers, yeah. I'm not going to double next year. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really big number yeah. now. It's, it's uh, 15,000 employees. Well. Double. It would be too much. Um, but so that's the nice thing about uh, renewable energy. You can do it in these little increments yeah. and a lot more efficient than traditional big power plants. Well, you know, what would you be interested in asking um, uh, your two colleagues here? Because they're in different sides of this uh, business, um, one, one in the digital side, one in, in the scale generation side. How is what they are doing going to affect your future? What yeah. would you like to know from them? So, so I guess on the, on the digital side, the back to stranded assets. Yeah. We, what's happening is there's two infrastructures being built, and they can't see each other. No, not hmm. yet. Uh, not yet. What do you mean by that? Explain so, so, that. So you have your current infrastructure, and now you have all this new infrastructure going yes. to all this rooftop solar all over the place. Um, you know, local uh, solar farms, right, right. Or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. You know, whether solar um, or, or uh, smaller wind or whatever the energy source is, um, the uh, existing infrastructure has no visibility into the into new, that infrastructure. new infrastructure. Yeah. And so it, everybody knows there's a capacity need, everybody's building it, and at some point the music has to stop and assets has to be stranded. Hmm. Um, it'll be a lot more efficient to start getting the, the two integrated. Now, interesting. Um, so you can stop building the, uh, the stuff that is uh, uh, hurting us and, and uh, do more planning with the new stuff. Jose, that's how do you see that? Uh, I see that, I see that um, on the generation side, which is the one I'm more, in more involved with, yeah. we're definitely going to a, final, to a final end game, which I'm not sure if it's going to happen within the next 10, 15 or 20, but the end game is almost all renewable, whether it's uh, the generation, distributed generation or utility scale de generation. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend on what the optimal, the optimal choice for each of the cases is. Um, now, in order to do that, 
the mobilization of capital has to be enormous, enormous. Um, and it's all about moving the non-converted into the capital deployment. Because, I mean, anyone here will be willing to invest and be, um, understand this industry. What we need to move is those who do not want to understand it, who do not understand it, who, who just an don't want to. not understanding it. it. Basically, yes. and the, the only element that moves, moves uh, across the line is uh, returns. And this is the other word you haven't probably heard here. I mean, you've heard stranded assets a hundred times. Well, I haven't heard once in the past uh, five years in any, of these, uh, in any of these gatherings is the word returns. And that's what really moves all the non-converted. It moves the converted also right. because we're, not, um, we're here to, uh, to maintain companies alive. But, and returns is, for example, the most important element in producing the appropriate economics is, um, is CO2 pricing. CO2 pricing is, is the element. So CO2 pricing will affect all the companies in this room and definitely all the ones in this, uh, in, in, on, the, on, this, on this stage. Hans, how do you see it? I see, oh, so many opportunities. Uh, first of all, I think that, first of all, the telecommunication networks will be aware of the power network. Yeah, interesting. That, that's the first thing that needs to happen. They need to be aware of each other in order, I mean, think about in the future when you have an electrical call and go home to your neighbor, you need to know that you're there. I mean, the network needs to know. So first of all, if you're going to have a sustainable city, sustainable transport, the power grid and the telecommunication grid needs to know each other. That's the first. That's just one thing that is just has to be there. Mm -hmm. Another is, of course, with solar power, thinking about the rural areas of the world where you want digital inclusion. Of course, having a digital inclusion with solar panels or solar energy together with digitalization means that you can create your business and a livable world, not only being in a big city. There are so many yeah. things that the, the energy needs to do, both for delivering more efficient energy and the awareness in between them. And the awareness will happen now when the cloudification, the supernova is coming, yeah. because then we will know. We see then power meters coming, smart meters coming up. You have smart cars that has that. So all that system, we need to put those systems together. Then you're going to get the efficiency. And, you go, and people are going to start asking for it. So if we, the, for the ones not changing, Somebody else will actually find out how to do these applications and actually connecting these different Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm having this thought as I listen to the three of you that the hundred billion dollars that people are talking about is actually going to be created by you. I mean, that is, you're going to drive down the costs. You're going to drive up the capabilities um, that in five years uh, will really enable all of this yeah. to, to, to scale, I, I believe. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, this to me, COP, is different. Um, precisely because of where you guys were at. Five years ago, it was small, it was nascent, we could dream, but now it's real. It's two and a half cent wind, you know. It's, it's the internet of things. Yeah. It's, it's I'm doubling every year. You know, yeah. this is not just a story that people are telling anymore. And one thing, one very important change is, I remember at Copenhagen sitting in front of Ivo de Boer and telling us, a bunch of uh, businessmen, that we had nothing to say there because we had failed to produce a model that was attractive to politicians. I mean, that was mind blowing, and that <laughs> was—I mean, I have—I have proof of that. I had a number of uh, <laughs> of um, people in that room. Uh, we apparently have provided the model now, uh, so it's about uh, now it's about policies because Solar City's model, without the right regulation will be killed. I mean, it's about regulation. In my country, in Spain, it d just doesn't fly because the, uh, the private uh, family, who the family who wants to put up a, 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 his own solar panels will have to pay part of the bill on the, on the transport and distribution. So the whole thing, instead of a five, seven year pay, payback, goes up to 15 which makes it a little it's bit more decision. difficult. Yeah. So regulation, and that's politicians, us pressing them, them putting up the right regulation. I think that's essential. Well, what, I, y y what's, what you guys are manifesting to me is, and it's something I've, I've seen in my research, um, the most often used phrase I've heard here in, in as I say, in, in six hours is stranded assets. The most often used phrase I've heard in researching my book is 
just in the last few years. Just in, and, I, and, and this I know very well because I, I wrote a book and I sat down to write it in 2004 called The World is Flat. And I did another book in 2011 about America, it's called That Used to Be Us. And when I sat down to write that first, uh, the second book in 2011, I got The World is Flat off my bookshelf just to remind myself what I wrote. You know? <laughs> and um, I opened it up to the index, I looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, F, A, C, E, B, Facebook wasn't in it. So when I was running around the world in 2005 when the book came out telling yeah. people the world is flat, we're all connected. Mm -hmm. Facebook didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place. Yeah. LinkedIn was a prison. <laughs> <laughs> applications, <laughs> applications, what you sent to college. Big data was a rap star. <laughs> and Skype was a typographical error. <laughs> okay. All of that happened yeah. in seven years. Uh. And that, to me, I think it is the greatest inflection point since Gutenberg invented the printing press. Yes. And you all yeah. just happen to be here, and thank goodness. Thank you very much, <laughs> thank okay? You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna take a 20 minute break, 20 minute coffee break. Really interesting. I really